ragged robin are certainly the most interesting member of the campion family. They are absolutely gorgeous and they have these really ragged shaggy little petals that are a beautiful pink colour and can sometimes even be white. They bloom in the months of May and June and you'll find them in wet meadows and in disused quarries and they are abundant around the Yorkshire Dales. The leaves are short, sessile and opposite up the stem and quite a lot of them have a little red edge to them and the petals of the flower itself are really interesting. So you can see that there are five main petals which are deeply toothed and are more or less divided into four different lobes and then on the inside again there are these other much shorter little petals that are surrounding the anthers. A particularly interesting flower to hunt out this summer is eyebright and you'll find it flowering in the lime-rich grassland and heathland between the months of June to September. They are a member of the Fugwort family and their tiny little flowers are between 5 to 10 millimetres in size. And this is why they are the perfect motivation to slow down and really take in the intricate detail on your nature walks. Their flowers form leafy spikes with a bell-shaped calyx and the corolla is made up of two distinct parts, a hood comprising of two petals you might say and a flatter lower lip that is distinctly lobed into three subparts. The corolla is predominantly white in colour but has purple streaks and a splash of bright yellow in the centre and their leaves are oval, deeply toothed and hairless. There are many different species of eyebright, however their differences are often so subtle that they are very hard to distinguish from one another. But the most remarkable difference you'll see between them in the dales is some having a deeper purple tinge to their hood compared to others. The botanical name for eyebright comes from the Greek word for gladness and its common name comes from the folklore of its ability to improve eyesight and its eye healing properties. It's been used in traditional herbal medicine in Europe for centuries and still to this day you'll find it in herbal medicines and cosmetic eye creams. But most interestingly, eyebright is a semi-parasite, meaning that it burrows into the roots of other plants like grasses to get some of their nutrients and this is why it can survive in really nutrient poor habitats. This may seem quite sinister, but it certainly has its advantages. And that is why eyebright, alongside its relative yellow rattle, can be referred to as the meadow maker. By stealing nutrients from vigorous grasses, it stunts their growth, which in turn leaves more nutrients available for other wildflowers to flourish. Eyebright has always been an important herb for botanists and it has even featured in the famous poem by Milton. He once wrote, Michael from Adam's eye the film removed with the false fruit that promised clearer sight has bred then purged with eyebright and rue the visual nerve for he had much to see. It's mid-June and I am so excited to be in one of my favourite wildlife trust nature reserves which is in a disused quarry and you wouldn't necessarily think that a disused quarry would be a place for such splendour and beauty but they absolutely are and 
it's a perfect time of the year for looking out for the second phase of your orchids. So early in the spring, we would have had the early purple orchid. And now we've come into June and heading into July and August, we're gonna be finding our common spotted, our fragrant orchids and the bee orchid, which is a really, really special orchid. So let's have a look at what we find. We can see loads of beautiful spikes of flowers here, all in your purples and pinks, and they're all orchids. So this one here, is an incredibly beautiful but actually not just beautiful but really fragrant it has the most divine smell does our chalk fragrant orchids oh my god i mean if you made perfume that smelled like that it would just be unbelievable so if you have a little closer look this is actually quite a tall spike this is absolutely fabulous and you can see that it has these rather slender uh, lancelet pointed leaves and then you have some opposite up the stem and then you've got bracts which are these um, leaf like structures that help protect the flowers and they're underneath each of the flower heads that are along this spike here and my goodness there must be 60 or more flowers on this spike. Now how do I know that this is a fragrant orchid? Well the cheat is that in a place like this where I have an idea of what I'm going to find if I get my nose in there and it's a stunning fragrant smell then it's probably fragrant orchid. Now in order to have a more specific way of identifying it we can look in at the at the petals and sepals and lip of the flower so you'll notice here that the lip is divided into three and the middle lobe of that lip is ever so slightly longer than the others and so this is really indicative of your fragrant orchid and the other thing I'm looking at is the lateral tepals which are on either side of the hood above the lip and the angle of these is characteristic of this plant so they will be either horizontal or in the chalk fragrant orchid slightly pointing down they have these lovely long spurs with the nectar in the bottom but they're ever so slightly too long so what it means is that in order for the insect to pick up the nectar they have to move really close into the plant and this increases the chances of that insect picking up the pollinia which are the structures that hold all the pollen on the plant and then when they fly off and get the nectar from your next um, fragrant orchid they will cross pollinate there is technically speaking three different types of fragrant orchid there is the chalk fragrant the marsh fragrant and the heath fragrant and they are very very difficult to tell from each other um, but the most obvious thing that gives you a sense that this is the chalk uh, variety is actually the habitat so we're in a limestone quarry here so we'll have you know rich limestone soil which is obviously where your chalk fragrant is going to grow absolutely beautiful so right next to this we have another lovely orchid and this is called the tway blade and the tway blade um, has green flowers and what's really distinctive about this orchid is the tway blades the two blades here at the bottom that are opposite each other and slightly overlapping so it's really useful early in the season you can get your eye in for those uh, leaves and then the tway blade flowers themselves are quite unique so they're green and they can have a slightly purpley or reddy tinge on the outside as if someone has colored in the edges and they almost look like little men and you can see that the lip is consists of two lobes, quite deeply uh, lobes, so two quite separate ones. And then you have your lateral tepals, which are horizontal and cupped round. And then the petals and top sepal form a hood over the top. And so what else have we got around here? Oh, fantastic. So here, we have some common spotted and the way you know you're common spotted is by the leaf so the leaf is spotted 
not always, but pretty much always. And the th one distinctive thing that um, puts this apart uh, from your early purple orchid is that the blotches tend to go laterally like transverse across whereas if this was the leaf of an early purple orchid they would be going up along the length of the leaf and when you see a comparison it's quite obvious and then as with all orchids we're going to be identifying them by looking at their lips and at the lateral tepals so you can see here that the Lower lip is divided into three lobes, reasonably deeply toothed, you might say, and the middle uh, lobe of the lip is slightly longer and is almost half the width of the lateral lobes. And you've got your lateral tepals, which are pointed ever so slightly up, and the petals forming a hood over the entrance to the reproductive organs which are pollinia inset in there and so the common spotted orchid is actually the most common orchid in the whole of the UK and you can see it in lots of different types of habitats um, it's quite successful at reproducing now this is the prize gem over here and we have one of my favourite orchids and one of the most distinctive looking ones and this is the bee orchid. What an exquisite looking plant. It is absolutely superb and it is designed to mimic a bee. So this plant doesn't actually produce any nectar and it encourages pollinators like bees to come here by tricking them into thinking that the flower itself is actually a female bee and it does this in three different ways first of all by actually and i think this is just so amazing it releases a fragrance and pheromones that mimic that of a virgin female bee so not only does it look like a bee, it actually smells like a female bee. And then the third and final way in which it mimics a bee is the texture, which you can see here. It's actually a lovely velvety texture so that not only will it smell like it, look like it, it will actually feel like a female bee and so what actually happens here is that the bee will come in and try to actually mate with the flower and then by doing so getting really close and nearby into this lip it then picks up the pollinia and you can see them just hanging I think there's one just hanging left up here and so when they come right in to do their business with the plant it actually instead of reproducing itself it's helping the plant to reproduce so it'll pick up the plinia which is the pollen pockets up here and then it will fly off to another bee orchid like the one up here and cross pollinate now ironically the bee orchid has gone to great lengths in order to reproduce and cross pollinate but the most frequent way in which it pollinates is actually self-pollination so the pollinia actually drop down into the ovary of the flower uh, which is quite unfortunate because it is actually there's an awful lot of advantages to bee orchids being able to cross pollinate so this is how climate change really affects our plants because if we have climate change increasing temperature if we have loss of habitat and we have the use of pesticides then the bees population is going to plummet down and then there isn't going to be a pollinator in order to cross pollinate and help flowers like this reproduce and it is a great shame that 
beautiful, exquisite flowers like your bee orchid are continuing to decline. And so it is incredibly important when we are out in our natural places that we take exceptionally good care. And so I make sure that every year that I will always give donations to organisations that are helping to preserve and help these plants. And that is the likes of the Wildlife Trust, Natural England and Plant Life, just to name but a few. And you'll find that there's loads of great organisations in your local area that you can support in order to ensure that fabulous flowers like this remain around to bring us much joy in our lives. A stunner of an orchid to look out for later in the summer is the marsh hellebrine. They are found in calcareous or lime rich fens, dune slacks, marshes and wet grasslands between the months of July and August. They are a member of the hellebrine genera within the orchid family. And unlike some of your more common orchids from the orchis or dactylorhiza genera, they have a slightly different structure to their lower lip, which is divided into a hypochyle and an epichyle by a flexible hinge that is roughly in the middle of the lip. From a distance they can seem unremarkable but for those of you who are prepared to stop and take a closer look you will be amply rewarded. The two stunning petals and hypochyle which is the upper part of its lip have beautiful purple veins and the bottom part of its lip the epichyle is white with a yellow throat and this lower part of the throat is almost circular in shape and is, has markedly frilly edges. The leaves at the base of the stem are broad and oval but get narrower the further you go up its reddish stem. It is a hardy little orchid and it is one of the few orchids that can survive in flooded ground but it is nationally rare and is markedly declining which is so sad, but it can be found in a couple of special locations in the Yorkshire Dales National Park.